chosen to be with me today as we uh, start in chapter 16 of the Gospel of Mark. It's taken us uh, many, many studies to go through the whole book. I've enjoyed it. I hope that you have. Um, it's, uh, we've covered some the, the, <laughs> the birth of Jesus Christ and uh, through his life and his teaching and uh, things that he said, his expression of his love and compassion and talking about the Father and his purpose for being here. And, and uh, we spent a good amount of time in, in uh, the chapter about uh, 13, about, uh, oh, the end times and what that means. And that took us a, a few studies to do that. But it's so important we recognize that Jesus is coming very, very soon. And um, this is not all there is. There's something else to hope for. And that's, we're going to get out of this life and out of this body, get a brand new one. And we're going to be with him. So shall we ever be with the Lord, reunited with our loved ones and our families. And, you know, my I, my, my whole family, besides the ones that Wanda and I, you know, kind of created <laughs> with the help of the Lord, um, the rest is all gone. All, all, all my except one cousin, uh, everybody's, everybody's gone, aunts, uncles, cousins, brother, mom, dad, uh, everybody, uh, except the one cousin, we, we keep in contact once in a while, and, uh, but I have so many, pastoring for almost 50 years, I've had so many people I've, I've loved so deeply that have gone before me, and I'm, I'm anxious to be reunited with each and every one of those, but beyond that, as much as I want to see Wanda, as much as I want to see my mom, my dad, my brother, all those loved ones that I've I've known over the years that have gone before me, hundreds, uh, if not more, um, I long to see Jesus face to face because he's the one who, as we talked it through the last several studies, we, we talked through his last week uh, and what he did and what he said and where he went and where his heart was. And then we talked about the last few hours of his life and, and what that was like with the betrayal and the, the mock trial that he went through and the hatred that he experienced at the hands of the religious leaders and, and then being turned over, you know, the crowd saying, release him, release Barabbas and give us Jesus. What, what should I do with Jesus? Pilate said, crucify him. They're yelling. And then the soldiers took him probably a Garrison of soldiers, probably between five and six hundred soldiers, are the ones that mocked him and scourged him and did all of the things they did to him. Then they, he went to the cross, they nailed him to the cross, and we spent some time with that and things that happened on the cross. And then we we left it at uh, he was done, and uh, he gave up the, his spirit and the completion of what he had done for us was complete as far as dying for our sins. So we pick it up today in chapter 16. It'll take us probably today and tomorrow to finish chapter 16. And uh, then we'll start a new study together. But um, in chapter 16, we see Jesus leading the final victory blow on Satan in the resurrection. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is the, the heart of the gospel. It is the good news. We talked about the good news, the gospel, what Jesus came to do. It's right here in the resurrection. Man. All four gospels tell the story of the resurrection and like the crucifixion, describe it as an actual historical event. Jesus was literally placed in the tomb on Friday, but when Sunday came, the tomb was empty. An angelic ambassador proclaimed Christ rising from the dead, dead to be a fact. And Mark 16 finishes the way his gospel began by declaring that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And through this eternal record of Mark's gospel, we are able to journey back to the borrowed tomb where Jesus had been buried as we examine the details recorded in, in the text, um, I, I just want you to, to see the power, the beauty, the, the fulfillment of the resurrection. Pick it up at Mark 16, beginning with verse one. 
Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Now, keep in mind, this is important, that these were women who had enjoyed a close relationship with Jesus Christ. They believed he was the, the promised Messiah. They had heard the words of the Lord and, and they had witnessed the, the miracles. Their lives had been transformed by this man. And yet he had been taken away. They watched him crucified. They saw that they took his body away and he was buried. And it just kind of seems that if their hopes and their, their dreams had been buried with them, the one in whom they, they, they'd placed their trust, the one who had, they had just let everything else go and this, this, is where, this is where we're going to be, this is it for eternity, he had been taken away way before his time they they had they they had felt he wasn't this wasn't supposed to happen he had not fulfilled all that he that they hoped he would the romans romans were still in power in fact their lives were now in jeopardy because of their faith they they've come all that they 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 feel is left and that's to anoint his body provide a means of honor and respect for the one that they loved so dearly. We see a picture here in these women of utter devastation, intense pain, and broken hearts. Verse two, very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. So they rose very early in the morning they came to the tomb. They were committed to doing all they could to ensure a, a proper burial for, for the one who had been so, so abused and rejected. Um, no doubt they were concerned for their safety as Jerusalem was in an uproar now over, over this Christ concerning him. They must have, they, they, they had to have been there and, and, and heard the crowds cry out, crucify him, crucify him. They, they must have known the words of disdain, dis, disdain uh, spoken as the crowds passed by his battered body on the cross. Some had probably heard the words of the malefactors as they, railed on him to prove his, his deity and power. I'm sure the images of those horrid scenes were still so fresh in their minds, but they were undeterred. They loved the Lord so deeply and were only concerned with bringing what honor they could to him. You know, and as we're reminded of our Lord's sacrifice and his resurrection, my prayer is, and for me, would, would, would it, my passion for him would be renewed and a newfound commitment be born within my life and my heart because of what he's done for me. And I pray that's your passion. Verse three, then they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone for the door of the tomb for us? As the women made their way to the tomb, they were concerned about their physical limitations. They were, they were not looking for a resurrected Lord, but focused on a stone that stood in, in their way. They had not come expecting the Lord to be risen, as he said. That was, just, that was, that was stuff that they hadn't even understood and they weren't even thinking about, but they were consumed with the... Uh, the apparent problem at hand. They could see the death, but not the deliverance. 
it may be easy for us to, to look back and wonder how their hearts could have been filled with unbelief. After all, hadn't they walked with him? They'd heard Jesus speak of the events of the cross. They've, they heard him speak of his promise to, to rise from the dead. But yet they, they were discouraged and they were doubtful. And before we get too critical, we need to consider our own lives. How many times have we experienced the mighty hand of God? How many times have we found the Lord to be the, the faithful and fulfilling for us? So faithful and so fulfilling for us. We, we, I think sometimes we're trying to celebrate the hope of our faith and yet we're burdened down with the cares of this life. And we see, yeah, I want to be like these women, but hey, I, what am I doing about my job? What am I doing about my house, my kids? We have to place our faith. We have to place our confidence. We have to place our hope in the risen Lord. He came forth out of the grave. There is nothing, absolutely nothing that happens in our lives that he isn't aware of and that he doesn't have control over. Nothing. I don't care what it is in my life, your life. There is nothing he doesn't know about that he doesn't have control over. He had the power to conquer the grave. Surely he has the power to handle the difficulties of our lives. We have not. I just don't want to focus on death and despair, but life and hope for eternity. We've not read a fable that has been handed down through the years. But the account of our Lord's resurrection, the resur this resurrection that I'm talking about should generate hope and expectation in each of our lives for better things to come, that he will handle this situation. He will heal this earth. He will bring a hope in, in the hopelessness that we have, many have. Pick it up verse four. But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. So they get to the tomb, and these women were greeted with an incredible surprise. The stone had been moved back. So they entered the tomb and they were greeted in Mark here that we have one angel speaking, but in Luke 24, it says there were two angels and Mark just focuses on one of the angels and describes him as a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the, on the right side. The, the white clothes indicating the, the dazzling character, I think of, of their glory. I can't imagine what it would be like to, to see an angel. These angels were witnesses of the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the behind the scenes work Jesus was doing during those three days in the tomb. See, even though we don't see God at work at all times, that does not mean he's not working. God is often working on our behalf in ways we can't even begin to fathom. The women were alarmed. This was a total surprise to them. It's not every day that a person has a conversation with an angel about someone rising from the dead. This truly would be a frightening experience. But remember, three days, they were in such despair. But God was busy during those three days. You may be in despair today, but God is busy doing what is right for the completion of what he's done and started in your life. Being confident of this very thing, that he who started a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Well, verse six, first part of verse six says, but he said unto them, do not be alarmed. <laughs> they had made their way, these women with hearts of fear. They were unsure of what the future would, would bring. As they came into the tomb, the angel spoke words of comfort. Don't be afraid. He was aware of their condition. The word afraid means to be alarmed or 
struck with terror. <laughs> they came fearful. They, they, they came afraid. But the Lord sent to them words of comfort. Their, fo their focus had been on the Lord's death. But victory had come with the dawn. The Lord was no longer in the tomb. He was alive. He was alive. Please, he's still alive today. I'm glad for the comfort and peace Jesus brings to our lives. He has the power to comfort the brokenhearted, the lonely, the afraid, the fearful. Listen, from my heart I say to you, life not be all you hoped it would be. There may be situations that are beyond your control, but take courage. Hope is not lost. Jesus is there to comfort your troubled heart. Trust in him right now. Just make a, a decision. I trust you, Lord. I trust you. I give you this hurt. I give you this pain. I give you this confusion. I give it all to you. I trust you. Going on, verse six says, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, <laughs> who was crucified. The angel was well aware of why they came. They had come to anoint the, the, the body of Jesus Christ. They had come for the Savior. He wanted them to know their search had, had not been in vain. The Lord was all they believed and so much more. <laughs> he wanted to reassure them in the Lord. Jesus had died, but he wasn't still dead. Hope had not ended in the tomb. We live in a day where many do not believe the gospel. Less and less, actually, people are coming against it. Maybe not less, but people are coming against it in, 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 in great abundance. They claim our faith is vain, that we believe in something that does not exist. I pray our confidence will be renewed. We've been saved by his precious blood. We belong to him. This world may not understand or believe, but that doesn't hinder our salvation, nor does that um, diminish our hope in any way. Our faith isn't something that we can hold in our hands, but it's still real. We can't expect a, a, a lost world to embrace our faith, but that doesn't distract from its power. There may be times when, when you are at the end of your rope and, and you feel like giving up, let me encourage you, look to Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. The same Lord you trusted in before remains able to meet your needs today. Yes, he died and they buried him, but he lives today. Look at the last part of verse six that this angel is telling these women, listen, man, he is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. <laughs> Nobody's there. It's empty. He's gone. He rose from the dead. The women came expecting to find the lifeless body of Jesus. They wanted to make final preparations for his burial. The angel proclaimed words that have resounded through the ages. Jesus is no longer in the tomb. He rose victorious over death, hell, and the grave. There was nothing that could hold him there. Absolutely nothing. Aren't you thankful for a risen Savior? I've been there. I've walked inside of that tomb. It is empty. Juan and I walked in there holding hands, tears streaming down our faces many years ago. And that tomb was empty. We, we have the hope of life beyond the grave because of his glorious res resurrection. He wasn't the first to rise from the dead. He had risen people from the dead, but he was the first to rise, to die no more. Those others, he rose from the dead. They got sick and died eventually. There is hope in these words of conquest. 
Cemeteries are filled with those who have died in Christ. <laughs> they're already with him, but their bodies lie waiting on the shout to come forth. One glorious day, all the dead in Christ will come forth out of the ground, some out of the seas, some out of urns, some just, they're gonna come forth and their bodies will be resurrected. And death has no longer hold no longer has a hold on the children of God. Verse seven and eight. Go tell his disciples and Peter, I love that, and Peter, that he's going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb for they trembled and were amazed and they said nothing to anyone for they were afraid. Whoa would be too, eh? What a change in the hearts of these women. They had come with very little hope, but left with the promise that Jesus lives. They received the news that Jesus had risen. Much of what we hear today brings little comfort. We're bombard, bombarded with the news of death, destruction, despair. We see it constantly, every day. But for the redeemed of the Lord, we can rejoice in the good news that our Savior lives. The women were given the promise of seeing Jesus again in Galilee. Verse seven, no doubt their hearts we haven't read it yet, but he, he said that. No doubt their hearts were filled with joy at the, at, the, at, the, at the promise of seeing the Lord again. We've never seen our Lord, but one day we will. We're promised that Jesus will return for the church. He will one day step out of the clouds and call for us. What rejoicing there will be when we get to look upon his face. <laughs> that ought to bring hope to our hearts. Life is filled with difficulty and uncertainty, I know it. But we have hope of a brighter day ahead. I want to encourage you to rejoice in your Savior's love and provision. We've considered the triumph of the gospel. The grave couldn't hold our Lord. Because he lives, we have hope of resurrection. We have hope of eternal life. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking for the day when he calls for the church. Bodies start coming out to be resurrected with their spirits. They begin to rise. I've made preparations for preparation for that day. How about you? Preparation I've made is just knowing that Jesus Christ is the Savior of my soul. If you've been washed in his precious blood, we've talked about it for days and days. If you've never been saved, today would be a wonderful day to come to him. And you know how to do it, just Jesus. I'm a sinner. Pray something like this, I'm a sinner. I, I, I choose to believe that you died on the cross for me. You defeated death. You rose from the grave. You're alive. And you're coming back for the church one day. I want to spend eternity with you. Please come into my life, Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me how to walk with you. Every day I'm alive until I see you face to face for eternity. Thank you, Jesus. Just pray something like that. Then call somebody in the other room and tell somebody, but tell some dude. Tell somebody, somebody's been praying for you, man. Just tell somebody who prayed to receive Jesus today. If you know anybody else, you can welcome to call our church. You have a church you go to, call them. Uh, but you can call us, 760-324-8281. Uh, 324-8281. And uh, we'd love to talk with you, pray with you. Uh, believers, we need to rejoice. We get so caught up in in life, we get so caught up. One of my one of my good friends, <laughs> uh, Pastor Bill Welsh, told me one day said the only problem with life is is that it's so daily, and boy, that's the truth. You go to bed and here it is again. You know, 
And sometimes we get so caught up with um, those kinds of things uh, and, and just, you know, the, the, the routines, the hurts, the problems, the jobs, the, the family, the kids, the, oh, the, the, the sickness, the illness, the loss of life. The, and all of these things are constantly bombarding us. And they do hurt, absolutely. But give that pain to Jesus. He'll carry it with you. He'll, he'll walk it through with you. You know, sometimes we go through some heavy stuff and we just need to lay it off on Jesus. Again, you need somebody to pray with, pray with somebody. You can call the phone number I gave you just to pray with somebody. We'll, we'll do that. Um, if, if we're not there, we should be. If we're not, we'll leave a number and we'll call you back. And we'll, we'll just love to pray with you, talk with you, whatever. But just give, give, give those hurts, give those insecurities, give those pains, give that stuff to Jesus. He wants to walk it through with you. We will finish up Mark tomorrow. All right. God bless you. Thank you for uh, being with me today. Jesus loves you, man. Love you back.